Welcome back to The Chosen Journey, Chapter 6, with Big Money Grip, Steve Carsey. Steve, how are you doing, buddy? Jonathan, how are we doing? Good to see you again. Do we get to do that uh, nickname uh, throughout? Is that, we're going to bring it back? <laughs> Whatever you would like to do. Uh, it, was, uh, it was one that jumped on me and, and kind of surprised me a little bit because I haven't heard it in such a long time. But uh, it was good to hear and uh, really put a smile on my face. Uh, how long was that nickname in effect, we didn't say? It was only in effect for the time that I played with Howard, you know? I mean, he's the one who brought it up, and, uh, you know, it was always kind of a, a running joke in the clubhouse with, with him. So uh, it was fun, but it never really stuck uh, after I got traded uh, in, in 93 from double A over to the A's. Nobody on the A's knew what my nickname was or whatever happened, so it kind of just was between uh, the group, uh, the core group that we had when we were playing together. I think with that group playing together, that nickname would have stuck out a little bit. They would have said, you're a big bunny grip, right? <laughs> Considering where they were at at the time. Yeah, maybe when I signed out of, you know, out of high school and, and got my bonus, but when we got to the big leagues, there would have been a couple of different big money grips uh, as that transpired. That's right. So just to let you know, I was looking for Howard Howard is, I don't know, man, he's as hard as you to find on the internet. Uh, <laughs> even when he sent over the comment, which I think it's him, uh, over on TikTok, he had a, like a number name, not an actual name. I uh, gotcha. He was following me. I followed him back. I said, Howard Battle, is that you? And then he put it that I, I cannot follow him anymore. So I think Howard wants to remain anonymous. But Howard, if you listen to this, man, we want to reach out to you. We want to talk more. So please, Howard Battle, if you're out there, reach out. Yeah, that would be great. It would be uh, really good to see him and see what he's doing and what he's been up to. Obviously, you lose contact with some guys uh, over the years, especially, you know, uh, guys like 25 years ago who, who get out of the game and, uh, you know, move on with their lives and, and start families and, and do their own thing. We'll find all of them eventually, man. Just give it time. Now, <laughs> now, we didn't mention you had the camo hat on last time, and now we got a new one. There's always going to be a new hat, it seems. I have the new shirt on. You always got the new hat on. Tell us about yeah. that hat, please. This hat is from 2021. It's uh, a division champion's hat uh, after we won the division last year uh, at home against the Mets and uh, had a little celebration. Still has a, a little smell of champagne on it, which is always nice to... Uh, you know, remember back to, but, uh, I don't know. It was just one that I was coming up the stairs today. And, uh, I was like, you know what boys are playing in Miami. It's fun to watch them. Uh, you know, let's root for them and put on a hat and, and, and remember last year and, uh, have hopefully have them continue what's going on. Cause they've been playing really good baseball. How was the hat collection set up by the way? Is there like a hat room? Are they all on, on shelves? Like how do you have your hats uh, aligned? Cause there's a lot of them. I, I, it seems like. Yeah, there's a ton of hats. I've collected hats for a very long time. Just being in the game of baseball, uh, you know, you pick a couple here or there. They give you hats, you know, like the camo one or a pink one or a blue one for Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, Veterans Day. You know, all of the ones that you celebrate and, and have special days for. But uh, if, the way it's set up around my house is you come in through the garage and there's a rack that has a bunch of hooks on it. And there's a bunch of hats on that. And then if you come up through the garage, up the stairs into the house, uh, if you walk into just about any room, you can find a hat laying around, especially with Kingston throwing his hats all over the place. And then <laughs> I, I do it on occasion too. So, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where hats are laying everywhere, but uh, the, the nice ones are, are hanging up uh, as you get in the garage and uh, walk up the stairs. Does he borrow some of the hats? Uh, yeah, he'll pick up a hat here or there um, and, and wear it. And he wears tons of hats to school. So uh, I think that's just so he doesn't have to do his hair in the morning. Okay. <laughs> I, I do not have that issue. So we're all good. But it's more the beard, the beard side of things. Um, and if you have to guess the collection, are we in, in the thousands as far as hats? Oh, goes? no, 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 no. It's not like that. I mean, when I find a hat that I like, uh, I, I usually wear that hat for a very long time. The old Milwaukee hat with the stripes is the one that uh, I've been wearing for quite a bit uh, this spring and, and fall, uh, fall, this spring going into summer. 
And, uh, you know, until that one kind of runs its course, I'll, I'll move on to the next. Now, before we jump into today's topic in the chapters, you know, we always go off sidetrack. We got to catch up. We have different <laughs> topics. But uh, you're talking about the champagne soaked hat there. Does that ever get old, whether you're a player or a coach, as far as the celebration and moving on in the playoffs? Uh, does those celebrations ever get boring? Never gets old. You know, I think everybody realizes how hard you have to work to reach the pinnacle of making the playoffs. Uh, obviously, they expanded the playoffs a little bit this year after the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, but, you know, it's division winners and a couple wild cards. It's usually, you know, five teams and in each division out of the 15 that get the opportunity to move on and play for, you know, the world series and, and get to do that. So, uh, you know, I did, I think it's just a reminder of, uh, the camaraderie, uh, the teamwork and what you go through, um, for a full season of 162 games, uh, as a collective group, uh, and understand that, Hey, you know what, this is just a small celebration. We have more work to do. But this is, you know, the first step, the first accomplishment of, of where we want to go. So, no, it never gets old. Now, as far as rings go, uh, little known fact for people, you always focus on the World Series rings, but there's also, I believe they still do them, divisional championship rings. But the, uh, as far as rings-wise, what, what have you seen as far as, uh, I know people, I, I believe they get them at the All-Star Game, get them as division, as, uh, as league champions. Yeah, that's correct. So if you win the American League and go to the World Series, you get an American League championship if you end up losing the World Series and vice versa with the National League. So, uh, you know, as a coach, uh, I was fortunate enough to get uh, a league championship uh, ring for the Cleveland Indians in 2016 when I was coaching in their system. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the Yankees 2003 uh, league championship, losing to the Marlins in the World Series uh, the year that I was hurt uh, in that organization. But, uh, you know, uh, I've seen plenty of rings. I've seen uh, what they look like from from friends of mine. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, as long as I've played and coached, uh, I have not been part of a World Series championship. It's really hard. So the guys that uh, do have those rings, and know what it feels like to win the World Series, uh, they understand how hard it is and, and what it takes. You need a couple of breaks along the way. Um, you know, you got to stay healthy. But, uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, for me, it's just one of those things where when you have that ring, not many guys wear them. They use them as, a, as something in their house and, and that they hold on to because they're so big and bulky, and maybe on special occasions. But uh, it just, proves of how hard it is uh, to be in any professional sport, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, hockey, uh, to get to the very end. Those two division rings that you, uh, the two league uh, championship rings that you have uh, in a future episode, are they accessible? that we'll be able to show them off. Uh, yeah, I think I might be able to find one or two of them that's in the drawer hanging out somewhere. <laughs> See, it's so funny because if I had those, I'd have like a towel down in the, uh, in the, in the little drawer. And then I would have it sitting on a little velvet pillow. Like I would be all, and you're gonna have to check the drawer. I love it. You have other goodies. It's just as well. one of those things. Yeah, I do. I have some other goodies that maybe I can pull out, yeah. pop up here and, and, and show everybody. And it's funny because like, and, uh, I, I, you know, I, we've talked before about collecting, right. And, uh, it, in my in my little collections of stuff like these things would get prominent places like i love these things you know and for you i think it's about the experiences not much about the material things yeah no absolutely you know like I, i've collected things over my career that uh that have meant things that that have meant stuff to me uh you know my first spikes i still have from my first major league baseball game uh that i pitched in and started um you know, first win baseball, first jersey, um, you know, my first win as a coach in the big leagues. Uh, I have that framed on my wall. So there, there are personal things, guys I've played with that I really respect and, uh, you know, go up and ask them for a bat or a ball or a hat. And then guys over the course of, of time that I run into uh, or have run into that uh, have some special part of the game 
uh, you know, like a Hank Aaron or things like that, you know, um, I'll, I'll get something signed by them, but you know, it's, it's something, it's the experience of being around those guys of having a conversation with those guys and be able to draw their experiences and see how I can learn from them. Uh, one thing I'll throw in is before we jump into the chapter is when the whole idea of the league championship uh, rings, I remember seeing on eBay, we brought up eBay before, and that's where, you know, the Carse swag came from. <laughs> and you can find anything on eBay, it seems. Somebody sold their 80s Dodger, early 80s Dodger league championship ring. And uh, it's I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It's like a UL Washington type person back in the day, like a role player. Anyways, I was, right. I was eyeing this thing, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know they had league championship rings. I'm like, I really should get this thing. And I didn't pull the trigger. And then like now, like with the, how the memorabilia has exploded, Lord knows how much that's worth because it's just, it's very hard to get people's personal effects. You know, it's funny. Like uh, you hear stories that like some people down out, down and out, they got to sell their items to make it ends meet. But other people are just saying, you know, I collect all these items. I'm not going to enjoy them. My, my kids, my grandkids don't enjoy them. Let's sell them off the collectors. Let people really enjoy them. Let's use the money for other things. So it's amazing how that whole, cycle of it's it's a big market out there like you know we talk about autograph collectors like as long as there's going to be sports there's going to be autographs and there's going to be memorabilia yeah no doubt about it i mean i i think uh you know certain material items mean more to certain people than than others uh and you know that's fine you know people love collecting things that they might not be able to get right um you know it's it's just one of those things where you know if you can get a tom brady ring it might mean more to a Patriots fan and a Tom Brady fan than it would mean to Tom. I'm not saying that's the case, but if it is, and they could, you know, he could use that money for such a uh, a bigger and better thing, um, you know, and he wanted to do it, then why not, right? I mean, that's kind of just how it is. They reversed that last Tom Brady touchdown football uh, the, that was sold at auction when he announced that he's coming back. So they made reparations for the guy who uh, bought it because – that, that football went from being, you know, uh, invaluable to, I'm not going to say worthless, but it's definitely went down a significant amount. So, uh, and, and as you, you had actually said over to me, we talked about it, Tom is off to his next career as well in the future and he'll be yeah. broadcasting. So I uh, wish Tom best, but he's still got another year to go. So uh, maybe another ring for only him. That football is only worth less, only if Tom Brady throws another touchdown this year. Pretty good chance that may happen though. It might. <laughs> so on today's, you know, uh, we are not doing on, on the journey. It's not a clear journey path. It's we don't know where we're starting. We're ending in the middle. The thought that came to my head for today's chapter is young Steve Carse, you know, growing up, you know, in New York. And I was curious as a youngster, when did you make it to your first game watching as a fan, whether it be a major league, minor league. Do you remember your first ever experience going to watch as a fan? Uh, it's a tough one. Um, sometimes I, like I tell my son, I can't even remember yesterday and you want me to remember so long ago, but uh, I don't specifically remember the first one. I just remember going to a lot of Met games in the 1980s, especially the mid eighties, you know, the Ron Darlings, the Doc Goodens, the Lenny Dykstra's, uh, you know, Kevin Elster, Keith Hernandez, uh, Mookie Wilson, all those guys, I can name them all. It's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, so I just remember going to Shea stadium, uh, quite a bit with friends of mine because we could jump on the uh, bus and then jump on the train and, and head over there. And it wasn't very far from our house. And, you know, that's what we did. We would buy a ticket for the upper deck. And then, uh, if it wasn't crowded, yeah, we try to sneak down and, and slide in and watch some more baseball. Um, but not a specific game. I remember as my first game, but I watched a, a heck of a lot of baseball growing up, whether it was on TV or playing it or actually going to some, some games. It's amazing because a lot of people don't remember their first games. I remember mine. I went to old exhibition stadium in Toronto. A friend of mine took me with his uh, dad and, uh, it was a 19 inning, 20 inning game. My first ever game wow. on the benches in the bleachers. And I remember around the 15th inning or so, a guy was making his major league debut, portly guy by the name of David Wells. Yeah. And I said, I said, this guy's not going to last, no chance. And I was wrong about that one. 
But uh, 19 inning, 20 in game. The Jays end up winning against the Mariners. But I, I had no clue. I was so young. I said, is this how all games are? Like, they're like five, six hours long. This is crazy. But yeah. no, they're not, fortunately. <laughs> but it feels like no, it's they're sometimes. Not. But it feels like it's sometimes. It's amazing how just being live. And that's one thing I tell young fans who do love sports in general. And they may be saying, you know, I've watched baseball here and there in TV. I said, it's like any other sport, you have to go in person. And it's a, it's a different electricity, especially different cities, you know, different teams, different opponents. There's nothing like that feeling, you know, and with you going to the Mets and watching them live as a youngster, would you say that's what created your love affair with baseball? I actually wouldn't, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the neighborhood was really what created that, you know, atmosphere is being with the boys, being with the kids, being out at 9 a.m. in the morning, playing wiffle ball. Uh, you know, we played sponge ball. We played football in the wintertime, basketball in the fall. Uh, and I played hockey in the wintertime as well. So we, we were, we were multi-sport neighborhood. So it just kind of ran baseball, football, hockey, basketball, whatever was going on at specific times. That's what we did. And we rode our bikes. We played bike tag. We would do what all the other kids do too. Uh, within the neighborhood, climb fences, you know, get on roofs, do all of that kind of stuff in New York. And uh, that's where my kind of love affair started with, with baseball. I just, uh, you know, played in the neighborhood. Uh, I had older boys that were basically in our neighborhood. There wasn't very many kids my age. Um, so I played with the older kids. And, and I really think that kind of helped me improve quicker, get better, and then, uh, you know, kind of just move on to the next chapter favorite player growing up was there one um yeah favorite player growing up uh was doc gooden and roger clemens as pitchers um you know i liked ricky henderson because he was on the yankees um you know i liked don mattingly uh playing first base with the yankees as well um you know so I was lucky. I had uh, both the Mets and the Yankees on, on TV, Channel 9 and Channel 11, so I could watch both of them. And then, uh, you know, as I got older, I went to a couple more Yankee games and, and got to uh, experience old Yankee Stadium uh, a couple times. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, but the majority of the time was spent at Shea and 90%, so like 90 plus percent at least was probably the Mets. Yeah, no doubt about it. It was so close to our house that uh, that we were just able to you know, within a 15 minute span, get over to uh, the stadium and, and be able to, to watch that. Doesn't that blow your mind though, growing up having Ricky Henderson as one of your favorite players, would you have ever envisioned then you're going to get traded for him? Of course not. You don't <laughs> ever think about that stuff, right? You just yeah. watch the game, you watch the players and you uh, get infatuated by what they do and how successful they are. You know, like I wanted to be Roger Clemens. That's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be Doc Gooden and throw his curveball. That's who I emulated. That's what I wanted to do. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, my son these days, his, he, he's watching Trout and he loves Shohei Otani because he loves to hit and he loves the pitch, you know? So he's like, why'd they take the DH away? Uh, why'd they take the pitcher hitting away? I'm like, well, that's just kind of the rules. And, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But those are the players that, he enjoys watching. He loves all the Brewers, obviously, because he spent a lot of his young years uh, coming to the games and hanging around these guys and being able to talk to them. Uh, even though he's so still so shy when he walks around Josh Hader, he walks up to Hader and, you know, Hader's Hader. And he's like, hey, brother, what's up? You know, and it's, it's just so laid back. And my son is like, uh oh, you know, like so shy about doing it. But then you know, as they, as they start talking, he kind of, you know, warms up to the situation and, and he just loves it. You know, I, I could tell you, you know, being your son's age, I don't forget. I don't, I don't uh, remember exactly, but I can trace back to, cause I think autographs, I was around 11, 12 years old. <clears throat> it was a big deal going up to somebody and again, and somebody you see on TV, you see them play in person and like, it's like, it's another world. And it was something that was a very hard thing as a youngster to overcome. I could tell you that, 
I think that's very good for Kingston's development in general, being around the athletes and understanding the environment of what they're in, because, you know, he knows that, you know, it'll be give him, it'll give him more advantages in life, certainly versus the kids that never had experienced before. Like for yourself, like, you know, imagine that you, right. know, how you, you grow up and then you throw you into major league, uh, you know, clubhouse for the first time, whereas he's been in there like thousands of times. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a good thing. I mean, you know, most of the time, <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you try to explain something to him. He's all like, dad, that's not what so-and-so said. I'm like, ah, okay. You know, how about using two hands instead of one, but it's all good. I mean, it, it's, it, you're right though. It, it's, it's a, it's a comfort level. You know, I wouldn't have even imagined growing up in the clubhouse as a young boy. I would not even have known that. And if I did, it would be, it might've been different. It might not have been, but uh, you know, it's just, it's an experience that he got to uh, enjoy and to, you know, be part of essentially what his journey is as he's growing up and, and moving into the next stages of his life. You and I got to grow up in a much different generation, which talks about, you know, we didn't carry around cell phones, you know, in our pockets. We didn't have yeah. the internet and, you know, it was just a different time to experience. And I'm, you know, when you're bringing up the name Doc Gooden, you know, people I think won't be able to appreciate because you don't have that internet from that generation, you don't have as much footage, but he was a big deal. Like he was a very big deal. Imagine Doc Gooden in the era of the internet, like, wow, you know, and, and what this man could have been, you know, even still he came back when people thought they wrote him <laughs> off, but this man was a once in a lifetime generational talent. Like he was a sight to see. It, it was special. It really was. I mean, being so young, right. I believe it was 19 when he got to the big leagues, one rookie of the year. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy to think of. And then even crazier to think of for me was I got to play with him with the Cleveland Indians in, in 2000 and, and got to spend time with him and talk to him and find out who he really is as a human being. And what a special person. Like, it's just one of those things that, you know, uh, you know, he had some demons, right? I mean, well, everybody knows that it's, it's chronicled and it's, it's out there in the papers, but, you know, he did everything that he possibly could uh, to, to, you know, withhold that and, and keep it at bay, um, you know, but to sit down and, and have a conversation with him and talk to him about the bats and talk to him about his path as he's pitching and, and to just to learn baseball from him in general uh, you know, was great. And, and that's what I take the most, I think, out of, uh, you know, my career is all of the great players that I got to speak to, that I got to play with, that I got to learn from, and then be able to pay it forward and be able to maybe teach my boy or my, my boy's friends and have a team that is going to play the game and I can teach them how to respect the game, how to play the game the right way. And, uh, you know, and prepare them for, you know, not only baseball life, but life in general, because there's so many lessons as we've talked about over the course of, uh, you know, a few episodes and, and on our personal time that uh, sports teaches us as youngsters uh, for life lessons. I think that without knowing you from back then, I would still venture to say that if your 40 year old self and your 20 year old self had a conversation, I don't think the personality was that different. I think you came pretty level headed going to the major leagues, which I think, which allowed you to stay in there for as long as you did versus I would say Doc Gooden, if his 19 year old self met his 40 year old self, I think his 40 year old self would have a lot to tell him, you know, and this man could easily been in the hall of fame if all the stars had aligned for him. But like you said, the demons are there and it's that excess life. And I think for, every, and I, and you know, it's funny because I've seen, you know, kids growing up in the minors that I've talked to at different levels, you can burn out an indie ball. You can burn out an A ball already thinking that you're a superstar and, and living that superstar lifestyle and not even having made it to the majors. It's amazing. You know, people can get into that excess lifestyle very easily. And as an athlete, it's just, it's very simple depending on the influences you have around you. Right. And the people, the company you keep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I just think that I was so naive to the whole situation with professional baseball. Uh, I, I played baseball for the love of the game. I played baseball because 
I enjoyed it and it was my passion. I mean, I played all sports, but baseball ended up being the one for me that was like, okay, I feel really good about this. And then, you know, I knew nothing really about the draft. The way the draft is held today is completely, completely different than how it was held 30 years ago. They would make the, they would have the draft, they'd make a phone call and tell you when you were drafted and then you would go on and negotiate if, if that's what you wanted to do or go off to college. You know, my main goal when I was in high school was, uh, you know, as we talked about growing up in a one parent household um, was to take a burden off my mother or my family in general uh, that supported me and get a college scholarship so I can go to college and pay for that myself through the, through the scholarship program through baseball. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough. I, I, I did do that as far as getting a scholarship, but not going to school. I had a scholarship to go to LSU, Louisiana State University, uh, uh, coming out of high school, and then had to make the choice once I got drafted. Uh, and again, I had no idea I was going to get drafted in the first round. I'll, I'll be the first one to, wow. yes, I'll be the first one to tell you that and first one to admit that. My, my eyes and, and my, I was set on going to college and doing that. And then when I got drafted in the first round, uh, you know, it was such, like I said, it was such a shock. I was so naive to the process and so naive to the situation. Uh, and there'll be another backstory that we'll get into on that stuff uh, on another program, but, uh, or another episode, but it, it, it'll be, it, it, that's an interesting story that I think people would want to hear. Uh, looking back uh, on the roster of Louisiana State, do you know any, if there was any future major leaguers that ended up going to school there at the time? Uh, there were, there actually were quite a few. Uh, ben McDonald was just uh, graduating in, in 89, I believe. Uh, there was a gentleman uh, there named Keith Osick, who was a catcher for the Pirates for a while. Uh, and God, I would have to, to think, but if you pull up their roster, I, I would I would venture to say uh, Lyle Mouton, outfielder, was there. So I, I would have to say that there would probably have been about five or six guys. They won the national championship in 1991, went there in 92, and won in 93. So those would have been the three years, 91, 92, and 93, that I would have attended that school. And I always get teased. I'm like, yeah, they won. Everybody tells me they won two out of the three years. They won the national championship. But they're like, well, maybe if you were there, they wouldn't have. So who knows? I mean, <laughs> don't know. Like you, you could, that's, you know, maybe you're going and you'd be better off having that seasoning. But on the other hand, maybe you, God forbid you get injured and you never make it to the majors then, right? There's, there's so much variables. But man, Ben McDonald, <laughs> another one, like. He Tremendous. was a big deal. Like I remember meeting Ben as a rookie there and he was a, like it, when, when the veterans are all parting the seas, when he comes out, you know, you're a big deal. And Ben McDonald yeah. was like right up there with any prospect back in the day. Like he was the Strasburg yeah, so, at the top of the day. Yeah. So as you're talking about it, Paul Bird was there at the time, left-handed pitcher, Mike Soraka, who played in the big leagues for a while was there. So there were plenty of guys who were very talented and uh, obviously uh, that went to that school. Last question as we're summing up this chapter. When growing up playing wiffle ball and all the sports and everything, at what point did you say to yourself, I want to be a major league baseball player? Or when did you first start saying that to yourself? When did you first envision that? Um, I think maybe around where my son is right now, about fifth or sixth grade. Uh, you know, I feel like, like, I just enjoyed doing it so much. I, that consumed my whole childhood. So when you have a passion for something, whatever it is, and it consumes you, like that's the road and that's the direction you want to take. I will say, I remember one story. I was 12 years old and, uh, you know, my sister was married at the time. Her and her husband lived, I don't know, 20 minutes away from from my house uh, where I was living with my mom and they had their family going and they lived 20 minutes away, but I would go over their house all the time. And when we drove uh, or when they drove, we would drive by Shea Stadium to go to their house on, on the Van Wick Expressway. And uh, I just remember one day 
and we were driving past Shea Stadium. I was 12 years old, going to the house for dinner. And I'm sitting in the back and they're sitting in the front. They're talking, listening to music. Uh, the next thing I do is I, I tell them, hey, can you turn the music down real quick for me? They're like, yeah, what's going on? As we're driving by, I told them, take a, I told them and pointed at Shea Stadium. I said, I'm going to play there one day. And they both looked at each other and then looked at me and kind of chuckled and was like, yeah, 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 you're, you're going to play there one day. And uh, I just remember that story because I told them and I'm like, you know, whether it was going to happen or not, who knows, right? But that was a belief that I had. That was something that I truly said to myself, I am going to play there one day. I didn't know if I was going to play there for one day or be a Met or playing the big leagues I didn't know but I knew that's where I wanted to play and that's where I wanted to be and uh you know again it got it got chuckled off a little bit you know a 12 year old saying that and uh you know lo and behold you know, 10 years later essentially I was in the big leagues at 21 years old and uh you know I was in the American League we didn't play at Shea Stadium but I was I was playing in big league stadiums at, at, at the you know, at the young age of, of 21 years old, which again, very fortunate and very lucky to have had that path and, and, uh, you know, achieve my goal. Sorry, buddy. You had to settle for the Yankees. Uh, that I say that tongue in cheek, of course, I love New York city. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. I've been there. I don't know how many dozens of times. And I could tell you from a youngster right up until today, there's one thing you could say going around New York city it's still Yankee town, no matter what, like, you know, if you're getting closer to Shea, you'll see Mets paraphernalia, but more time you spend in New York for most sports fans, you can't miss the Yankee aspect of it. The Yankees still rule the, the world over there going and being going to, as a fan into Yankee stadium versus going to watch the Mets. Uh, so I say tongue in cheek, you had to settle for it, but it was pretty freaking cool that you got to play in New York and you got to be with the Yankees. Well, you say that because you probably stay in Manhattan. Uh, I've been around Manhattan, the Bronx, even even Queens. You know, it's I, I when I go go to all the little shops and everything. I'm telling you, man, it's like 70, 80 percent still Yankees gear. If 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 you grow up in Queens, yes, and you live on Long Island, you're a Mets or Jets fan. If you're in the Bronx or Manhattan, you're a Yankee and Giants fan, and then Staten Island's kind of split a little bit half of them are yankee fans half of them are met fans so it's really kind of like uh where you grow up and and you know where the stadiums are to kind of what fans uh and of course your parents obviously uh are certain fans when they grow up so they kind of just kind of hand that down to you a little bit and and uh you know don't tell you what fan you're gonna be but uh you know it, it helps out i mean i just remember also you know, having a Montreal Expo hat when I grew up. I just liked the, the, the symbol of the Montreal Expo hat. And they were like, what are you doing? With I'm like, I don't know. I like Gary Carter. You know, I like I watched like watching him play when he was with the, he was with the Mets too, obviously. But, you know, it was one of those things where uh, it wasn't specific teams that I enjoyed. I just enjoyed the whole league and I enjoyed players. Kingston's favorite team in the majors? Oh, my God. Um, uh, he, he, he doesn't know. I like... <laughs> He's what well, he's almost very similar to like how I was like he's he roots for players. He likes the Brewers. I've been with the Indians, so he knows a lot of Indians. Uh, you know, he loves Otani and Trout. And I have a lot of friends who are within the game of baseball that he knows. And we go to different games. So he loves players. He loves watching the game. Um, and when I ask him who his favorite team is, like he just kind of changes as which way the wind blows, but, uh, and that's fine. I'm, I'm all for him watching games and letting him choose who he likes and who he wants to root for. It'll make him a baseball fan at the bottom, at the end of it. So we're going to yeah. stop the chapter here and pause, and then we're going to turn uh, back for chapter seven and a whole different topic.